And here's our next example. Here we placed a weight on the table. We still have a pulley at the end of the table, a string attached to the weight over the pulley. We have a second mass hanging down from it. And of course, even though we have friction between the first mass on the table and the table, I'm assuming that there's going to be enough weight here to accelerate the whole system down. And of course, by the time this weight hits the ground, we want to know how fast that object is moving, assuming that the distance is five meters. So it's a very tall table. All right. Uh, how do we do that? Again, we use the very same equation. We say that uh, energy initial equals energy final. And so we have potentially some work put into the system plus some initial potential energy plus some initial kinetic energy. And that should equal the final potential energy of the system plus the final kinetic energy of the system plus any energy loss due to overcoming friction. And of course, in this case, we realize since there is friction there, we're probably going to lose some energy. All right, let's determine what we have. First of all, I don't see anybody pushing anything while the system is moving, so no work input. There is potential energy. Now, notice that this is some distance above the ground, and this is some distance above the ground, but since this mass, assuming the table is at least five meters long, so this doesn't hit the pulley, this mass will not change in height. So we can just simply ignore the potential energy of this mass. So this is the only mass that's going to be changing height, so therefore this mass is going to be changing potential energy. So the initial potential energy can only be considered to be this amount right here. So we'd say M2GH, completely ignoring the potential energy of that mass, since it doesn't change anyway, and it would be the same on both sides of the equation, so we just ignore it. All right, how about kinetic energy? Nope, no kinetic energy because it starts from rest. Potential energy final. Strangely enough, even though that mass is up there, again, since we didn't account for it on the left side of the equation, we're not going to account for it on the right side of the equation, and this mass will have reached the ground, so at that point there will be no, no potential energy, so that will be zero. But the system will be moving, both the small block will be moving down, the large block will be moving to the right, so they both will have kinetic energy, so we write one half m1 plus m2 times v final squared. Notice, of course, that's the v final we're looking for. And finally, we are going to lose some energy because this block is being pushed across the table with friction between the block and the table. So realize there's going to be gravity pulling down on the mass, so we have m1g. We're going to have a normal force pushing back from the table to the block. That's going to be the normal force, and that's going to also be equal to m1g. It's going to be equal in magnitude to this force, of course, opposite in direction. And then we have a friction force. Since the block is going to be accelerating to the right, we expect the friction force to be directed to the left. And so force friction is going to be equal to the normal force times mu. And since the normal force is m1g, this is going to be m1g mu. So how much energy will the system lose while it's accelerating? Well, since this block is being pushed up against gravity, or pushed against gravity, we're going to lose energy to the tune of force times distance, and the force in this case is going to be the friction force. So this is going to be plus the friction force times the distance that this block will travel. Of course, the distance the block will travel along the top of the table is the same as the drop in height for this block. So D will be H, and the friction force will be M1G mu. So let's replace those with those, with those units or with those variables. So we have M2GH is equal to one half m1 plus m2 times v final squared plus the friction force which is m1g mu times h this is the same as the distance d and now we're going to solve this equation algebraically for v final which means we're going to move this term over to the left so that gives us m2gh minus m1gh times mu. I have reversed the h and the mu, that's okay. And so that's equal to one half m1 plus m2 times v final squared. The next step we're going to take is we're going to multiply both sides by two. So this two comes over here, divide both sides by m1 plus m2 right there, which goes then over here. And we could factor out a g and a h from the numerator. So when we do that, we get the following. So this two moves up over here, so we get two. We're going to factor out the g and the h, and then we're left on the left side with m2 minus m1 times mu. 
and we divide the whole thing by the m1 plus m2 that now moves over here in the denominator so that would be m1 plus m2 and then the only thing we have left on the right side of the equation since we got rid of the 2 and we got rid of the m1 plus m2 we have v final squared and now what we're going to do is we're going to take the square root of both sides and I like to move the equation around put the v final on the left side take the whole left side put it on the right side take the square root of both sides so we can say that v final is going to be equal to the square root of 2 gh times m2 minus m1 times mu divided by m1 plus m2 and notice again that we see that square root of 2gh in there which would be the velocity of the system if maybe you cut the rope and the block was just free falling to the ground it would have the velocity equal to this but since it's attached to a string the string is attached to this mass that mass also needs to be accelerated and must be pushed against the force of uh, friction here there's a adjustment factor here that makes it less than what it would have been without all that so now let's plug in the numbers and see what we get the final is equal to the square root of 2 times g which is 9.8 meters per second square the h is 5 meters times m2 which is right here 5 kilogram minus m1 which is 10 multiplying times mu which is 0 0.2 and the whole thing divided by 10 plus 5 keep it in the same order all right now let's simplify this so we have v final is equal to the square root of that would be a 10 times 9.8, so that's 98, times 5 minus 10 times 0.2 is 2, so that's 3, all divided by 15. And of course, 3 and 15 simplifies to 1 and 5, so that's 98 divided by 5, which is... Hmm, 5 goes into 120 times, so that would be 19.6. So this is the square root of 19.6. And what's the square root of 19.6? Hmm, let's find out. 19.6, take the square root, and it's 4.43 so meters per second. I leave the units out because otherwise it gets really messy. It's easier to see it without units. Quick check to see if we did everything right. So 10 times 9.8 9 is 98. 5 minus 2 is 3, and 10 plus 5 is 15. 3 and 15 can be divided by 3, so that's 1 and 5. 5 goes into 98, well, 5 goes into 100. 20 times, 5 goes into 95, 19 times, so it looks like 19.6 is correct, and there's the final answer. So, quick review. Identify what we have. We had no work input. We had initial potential energy because of this mass. We ignored this one because it didn't change height. We had no kinetic energy because the block started from rest. The final potential energy is zero because this block is down on the ground. They both will be moving with the final velocity, and so we account for the one-half mv squared for the kinetic energy of course you have to add both masses and then finally we lose energy because we have the friction force times distance and the friction force is m1g mu and the distance of course is the same as the height that the block falls and that's how you do that problem